All right, we're live then. All right, cool. So we didn't talk anything before this, right? I just wanted to uh, sort of, it, you know, more spontaneous and sort of whatever comes up is what comes up. Yeah, for sure. Let's do it. Yeah, I, you know, I just want to start. Like, I, um, I, um, I'm a big fan of your videos, man. You make really great videos on computer vision, and I've learned a lot from them. Actually, I've watched your videos on, um, you know, depth estimation, stereo vision, uh, sort of point clouds, uh, object detection. And uh, yeah, I mean, like you have one of the best channels around for those areas. And, uh, you know, I'm a big fan and uh, yeah, I think the machine that. learning community is, you know, grateful to to have you around and sort of all the great content that you create. Yeah, you and, too. Uh, like, uh, thanks a lot. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you and get to know you more because, you know, we're not really that many in this field, right? So it's cool to... Uh, to sort of get get closer to the, the sort of the machine learning communities is actually quite small, I would say. Yeah, and especially like the the creators out there, like the content creators, like uh, video creators and stuff like that. So there's a lot of like passive uh, passive like um, people out there in the uh, machine learning community. Um, I've just recently started like getting into like the the community on LinkedIn as well. I'm doing some posts on LinkedIn, uh, trying to grow my uh, my personal brand on LinkedIn as well. Um, it seems like there's a pretty like large community in there for both like machine learning and, and basically just like a technology, uh, developing technologies in general. So um, it's a pretty, pretty exciting community as well. Yeah, for sure. Also similar for me, like I started on just making YouTube videos, but now I'm trying to also become more sort of on LinkedIn as well. And I don't know, not that much on Twitter, but Twitter is also really cool. But yeah, I don't know why I, I for me, it's difficult. It's almost easier in a way to make videos rather than uh, writing. I don't know why. I just never find writing to be my thing. But uh, it's definitely, I mean, it, it might be like for me, I want to definitely grow that aspect as well and get better at sort of communicating in both uh, formats. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I have never really done like any any writing other like, uh, like the only writing I've done is, is basically like a report in universities and, and stuff like that. Um, so I'm... I think it's just like, I find it just easier to just go, go in there, like do a screen recording, do some like editing afterwards. I'm um, just getting content out there where like, if I had to do it with, uh, with text, I will have to put in like way more time. Um, and I, I wouldn't feel that I, I would con like con contribute like that much um, by doing like written content. And I also find it that, that most people, I'm not sure about it, but uh, I find that most people find it more entertaining to like watch videos compared to like, um, reading tutorials and stuff like that like i know there's a pretty good like blog post and so on on medium uh, medium for example um i also read a lot of those um so they seem pretty interesting but i also know that a lot of time has been put into those um to make them really good um and then i then i basically just like prefer the the, the video way instead yeah for sure for me uh, when it comes to like if someone has made a really great video on something versus a really great blog post, I will 100% take the video. I find that a lot easier to digest. Uh, but, you know, I mean, you have to sort of papers are all written, right? And uh, and uh, sort of there are really great blogs as well um, oh, sure. that I read. Uh, but like, I guess that's why we make videos. Maybe we prefer to, I don't know. How did you get into making videos or what made you get started in that? That's just a, one point before before I'll uh, I can talk about that. So, so yeah. also like with, with videos, we have the YouTube algorithm that will take like care of like distributing like the videos, the content, and all those different kind of things for like a specific target or like a specific audience. Uh, where I don't really think that we have such a good like algorithm um, for text um, yet. Of course, we still have like Google, but I just find it more like I think to find it easier to just use YouTube. You get a lot of recommendations from different people. Like you can follow people. Uh, fairly easily get notifications and so on. So I find with like videos and just YouTube taking care of, of that with their algorithm, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to get started with. So yeah, so basically I started in in university with my uh, with my YouTube channel. I kind of just started out in, uh, in the start, I was thinking about like, okay, I'm learning these different things here. Um, maybe I should just like create some kind of like video, uh, video like um, video notes instead of just like taking notes in classes. Uh, so basically I was just going to the classes. I was going home doing like summaries um, creating like some of the the projects, exercises, and those different things, and then I was just like creating videos around that. 
So I fa- found that that was a um, that was a better way for me to actually like learn new stuff and also like to to keep engaged, because if I didn't have to like go home and, and do the videos, I wouldn't like pay as much attention to to the actual like content in the courses, um, and I wouldn't probably have done like the exercises either. Or um, <laughs> if I didn't if I didn't go home and do the do the videos like immediately after the classes. So that was kind of like how I got started. I also wanted to create like some kind of like side a side hobby, side business, just try to like grow it over time because I knew the, the possibilities and and the different like opportunities that we can that we can get with YouTube and and basically just getting your personal brand out there. Uh, so it wasn't it wasn't like the plan in the start to like scale YouTube like um and try to see like how far it could come. It was more just I just want to create some videos, people started liking it and then it just caught my interest. I like um I like to just teach teach other people was what what I was actually like doing and also I, I found that there were not a lot of tutorials out there with for example though so I started out with computer vision uh, there's not really like a lot of tutorials out there and most of the tutorials were actually like in python uh, so at that time I was more into like C++ like a low level um, C++ also with OpenCV but more like low level C C++ with computer vision um, and I didn't really like find that many tutorials out there doing um, doing those different things so that was that's basically really like how I started. That's so it's really interesting that like you didn't. I mean, it's for you kind of. It was just to start with sort of summarizing to for your own learning. I would almost say right. And yeah, then, for sure. And that's pretty interesting. So, well, like, how would you say that? Um, like, do you, there are some people that ask me like, uh, do you do you find that it's been beneficial for you when it comes to like opportunities and so on? Uh, do you feel that or sort of what's your uh, viewpoint on on? I guess like in a way you're documenting what you're doing and sort of growing your personal brand that way. Um, right. Uh, how has that been like for you? Yeah, it, it has been actually like uh, pretty interesting. And, and I've seen like a lot of different kind of like opportunities that I wasn't even, that I wasn't even aware of when I started out, I was basically just trying to like, okay, let's get to like YouTube partner program. Let's get monetized. That's, that's the goal to start with. Um, let's get to 1000 subscribers and, and all those different things. It was just more like, it was maybe just like a side business, like some kind of like hobby project. Um, I wanted to just like teach other people uh, what I learned, use it to actually like just learn myself. Like when we're doing these YouTube videos, uh, we have to like do a lot of research. Like I'm scrolling LinkedIn, Twitter, and all those different things um, a lot, and also just YouTube to get like new ideas. So I'm, I'm also using it to stay up to date with uh, with new projects, new models, and and all those different things. So I think that is pretty beneficial as way uh, as well and. It has made me like up to date on on a lot of different kind of things that that I wouldn't have if I didn't have my YouTube channel and and all those different kind of things. Um, and then also just like recently, I wasn't even f- familiar with it, but like I get a ton of offers. You probably also 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 do. Um, but both like promotional stuff for different companies, um, also like work related um, work related projects and so on. So I have some freelance projects on uh, on the sideline. I also have some like full-time positions um, offers through my YouTube. So like all of the offers that I get is basically like from my YouTube videos um, and my channel. And I wasn't even like, I wasn't even considering that when I started out, I wasn't even considering just like one year ago. Um, but the, but once it's scaling, it's just, it gives so many possibilities and opportunities that um, that I wasn't familiar with. And it just, it just keeps me more motivated to actually like create content. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty nice. It's pretty nice, I would say. Would you say that for for other people that are sort of uh, maybe learning and want to sort of grow as well and be, sort of build a career in machine learning, that this would be a, a, an advice you have for them? Maybe, you know, we talk now specifically for YouTube, but do you think there are other ways as well? Maybe on, you know, as we talk about LinkedIn um, and so on, would you say that this is like a strong uh, advice you have? It's a it's a really strong advice. Like if you don't want to like create videos, you can create like blog posts. If you don't want to show your face and stuff like that, um, you should like have your name out there somehow. Because I tend to say that, of course, like I have a I'm I'm based in Denmark. Like we have like five point five million uh, people here. Like it's a really small country. Um, if I wasn't like a personal brand out there, like my audience or like my target would basically just be like Denmark or like more specifically my own city. And then like for the whole world, I will pretty much be unknown. So I think it's pretty, pretty good to like grow your personal brand in some way. You don't have to create like a YouTube channel, um, LinkedIn channel, or like probably just something like that, but just get out there, get your name out there. Like if you don't want to create anything, just create some GitHub. Like you can also create your GitHub where you can get like followers, uh, stars, like, uh, 
just get something, just build something, get your portfolio, grow your personal brand in some way. Because again, like if you want to get out there, if you want to get a lot of good offers, like you have to be out there because like if you don't have anything on the internet, you will basically just be like unknown. Like people won't know that you even exist. So in my opinion, like it doesn't really matter like how good you are. Of course, like if you're good, you could have like the possibility of like getting a good position if you're applying for jobs and stuff like that. But I just find it easier to to grow my own brand and then people come to me um, and then I can basically like decide on my own. But again, you, you have to be out there. You're like, you have to be visible for the world or or else you will pretty much just be, you'll be unknown and the, the opportunities and possibilities will be, uh, will be limited for sure. Yeah. I, I also like the lowest, I guess like lowest hanging fruit is to document on GitHub, right? Because I know there's a lot of people even that, you know, are studying and so on and they don't document uh, projects they're doing or so on. So like when they graduate, like they have, like it, their GitHub is basically empty and that's like the worst case scenario, right? Because oh, then true. like, like how are you supposed to be able to showcase, you know, your skills and what you can do and sort of what you've been working on when it's only, you know, course related. Um, and, and so I think like, as you're saying, like to me, I've been reflecting over this, like if, if somebody is starting out that I really like one of the key things I would say is to document what you're doing and the, the format doesn't matter too much, but you have to uh, do that not only for others to see, but also for your own sake, where honestly for me, like, I don't know half the projects I would have done if they would have been, you know, even half as good if, if I didn't document it, because like, it's just taking it to another level when you know that others are going to be reading that, watching that you want to make sure that their time is well spent. Cause I know for you as well, like if you get a lot of views in a video and the watch time is getting, uh, you know, you, uh, there are a lot, that's a lot of human time. And so I really tried to spend, you know, the, the, uh, like the, the best I can to make sure that that time is well spent by, by the viewer, right? Like, obviously no, sure. you're going to fail, but like, doing that it also increases the quality of your work i would say um and, and, uh, do you feel that yeah for sure like uh, you you can actually just see how you're growing over time so when i'm looking back on my first videos right now even though like when you're doing tutorials and those different things like even though you don't get really you don't really get views in the start like some of the videos i had in the start i was excited i got 200 views or something like that but okay, I got 200 views, but right now, like those videos are actually like my best performing videos because the YouTube algorithm just takes over. Yeah. Um, and some of my worst videos they actually like, have like uh, 50K uh, views where I wouldn't even imagine that when I started out like two years ago. So um, so yeah, that, that's that's actually like pretty, pretty good. And also just to like go back and see, okay, how are you developing? Like how are you involving over time, both like personal, uh, personal like the video, uh, video quality, how are you doing things and and those different things. So recently I've been more focusing on like creating uh, better quality content because I get like more possibilities right now. Um, I have more free time to do so as well. And also just because you have to do that, like you have to, you have to keep um, evolving over time. You have to develop your, your own, um, you have to develop, develop your own, but I think it's a pretty good way to, to just track your progress, to, like track, uh, track how good you're doing and, and just try to like be better for, for every video. So like if people are starting out, you should, just create a lot of content like in the start you should just like focus on like uh quantitative quantitative like you should just like put videos out there and then over time you should focus more on quality um but in the start you just have to do it you have to learn by actually like, just doing the mistakes just create some content try to learn like video from video if you're improving improving like for each video you like you will get really good content um at the end and even though you create like really bad videos in the start they will still like it will, it will basically just grow over time and and even become your best videos as uh, as in my case what do you think is the challenge for people uh for because as i said, we said in the beginning there are not that many people that make videos and not that many people that have a blog even um you know it's talking sort of from uh an overview of how many people are you know studying machine learning and so on it's really really few i would say so how would you like I mean, like, what what do you think is the challenge for people to get started in doing that? Uh, and wh how do you how do you like wh what was challenging for you? Was there any was it challenging for you to start making videos and so on? Um, it, it kind of like I think the main reason is like it's basically like the same in in most areas. It is it is you just have to like act. You just have to do something. Like I think people. I think people are scared of like getting started because in the start you will be really bad. Like 
you're not going to be good at something like you do for the first time. Um, that's for sure. But you just have to like keep evolving over time. And even at the start, I, I didn't want to tell like anyone that I was having like a YouTube channel because yeah. I knew that I was just getting laughed off. Yeah. Um, I was uh, I was in uh, I was in university. Like my videos were out there. I was basically like creating. Um, I was basically like creating the content around the courses that I had. So when people had to like read up for the exams or like some of the exercises they couldn't like finish or something like that. Uh, they were basically just getting up my videos and and they were just like saying, oh, you got a YouTube channel, you got uh, 400 subscribers or something like that. Um, so it was it was kind of like cringe in the start. So in the start, it will be very cringe. Like I didn't tell anyone um, I probably I probably should have. But also like it's not it's not like it's not really motivating to get like if people are laughing because you're like creating a YouTube channel. Or you Now you want to be like a, a big YouTube star, star like you want to you travel the whole world. Uh, and all those different things so yeah. i think that's the hardest part like i think i think people people don't they don't want to get started because like pe people will just like they will just be like oh you're just you're not going to be like the next youtube star um i think that that is uh you have like some kind of like cringing cringing factor at some point but then like once you have some good quality content you will just be like Okay, now at at a certain point you will just say like now it's not cringe anymore. Like now I'm actually like proud of what I've built, um, how far I've come, and now it is giving me these these opportunities here. Um, so like the people the people laughing at me with 400 like subscribers, now they have to go out and find a job uh, where I can basically just choose whatever I want to do uh, with my own life. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that also. I mean, like it, I have you have to kind of reflect on what you're doing, right? For me, I sort of i could definitely relate to that sort of making yeah. videos because i know as well like i did the same thing kind of like with courses and then i think like people that studied with me would like watch the video that i created on the, like at the same uh, time as i'm taking the course <laughs> so like i mean same. like yeah and then it's like i mean that's sort of what i can understand what you mean by like cringe because the, i don't know people have this idea also of like people that make videos they're supposed to be like some god or something yeah, like for sure. it, it's it's all we're all people behind the screen right we are all sort of learning as we go and some people you know just decide to document it there's really not that much different um and so but i can relate to you sort of <laughs> having that uh challenging sort of facing that uh yeah for sure and, and you just have you just have to like uh you just have to like think about like the possibilities and 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 the good things like the positive things that that um that you'll get from it like you just have to like keep on doing it and it's basically like it, it doesn't really matter like in what area if it's youtube if, if it's just like creating like company startups in uh, in general um like people will not be fans um until you have a uh, act like done it and accomplished something um so yeah, but, but also like I think that. I think I would also say like you should be proud even from the beginning because like what you're doing fundamentally is you're trying to put out material that can hopefully help someone, right? Yeah, or, sure. I mean if it's if it's bad too, like people won't watch it. That's fine, right? You're not expecting people to uh, watch it. Like you're just creating a video, and everybody has that. Uh, and sort of that's what I would encourage. Sort of whatever you're sort of take that opportunity and just it will you will develop from it. Uh, but, you know, there is two sides of it, right? We're talking sort of, the, there is a positive side of getting yourself out there. There's also uh, perhaps a negative side, and that's what scares people, right? Because being judged, getting, you know, negative comments, getting uh, laughed at, you know, for making a bad video or something, like people, uh, like it's a reality too. And so you have yeah, to be sure. able to face that. And I think one way of facing it is sort of self-reflecting of what you're doing, because you're fundamentally doing something good. Like you are adding a valuable thing uh and it's as you say too like it takes time for those videos to get noticed in the yeah. beginning you might just have a few hundred views but and people might be like yeah you only have a few hundred views but then they will it's not like in other areas of youtube like when, we're, when you're creating educational content uh, it will continue to help people over time it will never sort of die out no, no. Uh, or very rarely like in some cases there might be libraries or uh, that you know are updated and so on but uh, in general uh all right so uh, yeah okay we talked a lot about I, I would like to get i mean we can talk about anything right uh but i have some ideas of what we can talk about uh like one thing i'm curious about is sort of um you know i know you're really into sort of when we talk a lot more technical things uh for like depth estimation and so on 
I have not d done that many uh, projects in depth estimation, but uh, so I'm curious to sort of learn from you uh, to mm -hmm. get an idea. Because like in depth estimation, right? You normally like you do like stereo vision. There is like monocular depth estimation as well. How would you or let me know if there's something I'm missing, missing yeah, right? For sure, for sure. But those are sort of the two big ones, right? Is that correct? Yeah, we have like we have a, both like stereo vision. We also have like a monocular. Uh, it, all of those different things that they really depend on your your project and, and application. Uh, so there's a lot of like research and development going on with like monocular depth estimation. Um, but you will have to like it really depends on your your situation and also like the accuracy that you need. Um, so right now it is basically just like models trying to estimate. So if you're just talking like by, about like monocular, it is basically just like AI models trying to predict depth in the in the image. So it will it will only be like a relative depth um, in the image. So you can't really just you can't really just use like a monocular camera to get like accurate depth in, if, in information um, in in the relative uh, or like in the absolute um, in the absolute world. Um, then you will actually like, need some kind of like active sensing um, or um, a passive sensor, like a, a stereo camera. Uh, there's a lot of development going on. Like there's some a really reference point, maybe like if you have a reference in the in the uh, like environment, like if you know the distance to a particular point, and you yeah, have but, a relative. Yeah, uh, you, you 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 can you can do some kind of like that. You can do like then interpolation or like some something like that. Uh, you can have some reference points and you can maybe just like do like linear regression on those reference points but it requires you have like a static camera and like um the environment doesn't change that much because like if you have like for example let's say we have like monocular camera here um and then i have an object i'll just take it here like if you have an object here um and then suddenly i want to like calculate the distance to this and we have a reference to it because we will basically just get a depth value if I suddenly just have like an, some some other object, like for example my microphone here in front of it, then the depth value to this like AirPods case here it will actually like change, even though the distance to the camera hasn't changed because like it's all like relative. It tries to like estimate the depth based on like all the objects and and the act like scene. Mm, okay. Um, so even though like the distance for, for these two objects are exactly the same from each other, depending on the scene or like where like what the camera can see, the depth value will actually like change. Uh, so it really depends on on your situation. You can also do, for example, like I, I know that Tesla uh, they're only using um, Tesla only using um, neural networks now to estimate depth as well. Uh, but they they okay. they do some they do some pretty they do some pretty nice things, and they have also like trained their models on like for example like lidar to get the to get really good like depth accuracy um, with their networks. So those are more like specifically trained for a specific purpose where like the other ones we have like miters and and some of the other depth estimation models, uh, they are basically just like general purpose, but it, it could be useful if you have like a static setup or if you just want to like have a robot driving around, you can have like um, obstacle avoidance, for example. So I've done some projects so with, uh, with the monocular depth estimation for um, for obstacle avoidance, because with obstacle avoidance, we don't really we don't really care about like centimeter accuracy. We just don't want to know like okay, what objects are like close to us, right? And then right. we can and then we can navigate the the environment based on that. Right. Okay, that's a really good sort of overview of monocular. Like m that's my understanding as well is that monocular yeah. is more for sort of when you like you, you don't get the precision right, and then you yeah. have stereo vision for sort of for the actual um, you know ac when you need accuracy, and then I think there are sort of when it comes to that too, there are many things affecting like in stereo vision, you seem to have like more like deterministic algorithms, right? I don't know. I don't remember like you have like SIFT and like RANSAC and then you have like you have what is it called? Like there's one. Uh, uh, is it like DLT, direct linear transform or something like you do that you can get from stereo vision? Like, like it's able to deterministically find right depth. You don't need a neural network to do that, right? No, no, for uh, sure. Yeah, it is basically just. What, yeah, so so of... like, yeah, so they have the we have these uh, we have these algorithms here, like so so SIFT and those uh, things are basically like for extracting features, um, in the frame because we want to extract like we have two two cameras like a stereo camera we have two cameras we want to find the exact same points in both cameras and then we want to match those, uh, because then we can look at like how does the pixel change like from one camera to the other camera. Um, and then we have what what's called a, like a disparity. And then when we have our cameras calibrated, we have like all the camera information as well. Um, and then we can then estimate the depth based on uh, on those two points, like how different are they um, from camera to camera? Because we also know we know we know like all the information about the two cameras. We know all the relations. 
uh, for the two cameras. Then we can use that information um, to both get like sparse depth values. If we want to find like specific points with, for example, like a feature extractor, uh, then we can find like ex uh, sparse points. We could also like have an optic detector. Finding optics, then you use those points, match them into two images. So there are some algorithms for that. Um, I have some videos with that for like OpenCV, how you can how you can like uh, do. Yeah, both I think I followed that and, uh, video actually. Sparse and dense uh, yeah. depth estimation, and then it, it will basically just be uh, be an algorithm like going over like all the pixels, both like sparse pixel, but also like just like full images. Um, so you can both you can both do that if you have like um. If you have like your own stereo camera set up right now, there's also like a lot of good like stereo cameras out there that will just directly output um, a point cloud, so like an RGB D image. So you have the RGB uh, RGB uh, R RGB colors, and then you also have a depth map, um, and then you can basically just combine those into a point cloud. Um, so I've worked with some cameras, like for example, uh, Real Sense, like Intel Real Sense. Uh, they're not not as good anymore, but uh, the Set Two I is actually like a pretty good uh, pretty good depth camera for. A lot of applications, it's around like 450 bucks, but then you can actually like get really, really accurate like depth values up to 20 meters. So they go all the way from like uh, 0.2 meters, um, so it's like 20 centimeters up to 20 meters. Um, and getting depth accurate like depth values up to 20 meters is actually like uh, it's actually like pretty good. So so it's a very good camera, it's, and it's used in a lot of like robotics applications. Um, slam like uh, V slam applications and so on, where you want to do like mapping and uh, and localization. So let's let's take a like a hypothetical scenario. If you just buy like two simple like Logitech cameras and you put them on a on a stick and you know measure the distance between uh, them, like what type of accuracy could you potentially get? And like what what are the limitations? Sort of when talking about the camera specifically, uh, I know you have like focal length and all of that stuff. Like what's what's actually important for uh, for getting accurate depth uh, or estimation? It would basically be like aligning the cameras and then like uh, and then the calibration of the cameras. So we need like really accurate um, calibration. So so we have the exact relation to the two cameras because like even if you're just like deviating like a couple of pixels um, in each camera, like let's say we have like for example like full HD camera and they deviate like just a couple of pixels, um, then like the depth values can be be totally off. Like probably like within like a couple of centimeters or or something like that. But uh, but but with us with us semi budget like stereo camera if you just put them up and uh, set them up together you can also buy some relative cheap um stereo cameras you can you can get down to like centimeter accuracy and um and that is that is suitable for like most applications where like if you want to like get higher accuracy or like longer accuracy it also depends on like how far do you actually want to 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 to, to like be able to get the depth values uh, for um so that depends on like the baseline between the two cameras um so like the closer you have them together, like the closer you will be able to see, but the further you get away from the camera, it will then be harder because then the changes, um, then the change, right. like the closer the two cameras are together, um, the further away the optic is, like the larger the changes for per pixel value will be. And then like the less accurate, um, then the less, uh, less accurate the depth values will be as well. Uh, right. So, so you, the baseline you, depends on, yeah, it really depends on your application. Um, yeah. Okay, interesting. So let's see, just like an overview of so talking about depth estimation then. Like, you have, okay, so you have like monocular, you have stereo vision. For stereo vision, you can have like different types of uh, setups and you can use uh, like deterministic algorithms that you can sort of set the, 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 you know, set it up differently depending on the use case. And probably the camera might change also like what type of parameters you want to have. But when talking about sort of deep learning for depth estimation, what uh, what sort of the uh, benefit of that, or sort of what is the what is the uh, step towards deep learning based methods? Um, I, th I think it will basically be um, like some of those algorithms they can run like pretty like they can run pretty fast. Um, it might also be easier to because like not a lot of like computer vision algorithms are actually like, supported by by CUDA in in like the different frameworks. So you'll actually like have to. If you were to implement it, you will have to like put in a lot of effort to actually like get it to run on on a GPU. Um, of course, of course, you can do it, but it, it is just easier to like have a deep learning model throw it onto the GPU because we have all these different kind of like optimized frameworks. Um, so it will be easier, but it will also be pretty good at like interpolating between the between the depth values um, and basically just like smoothing it more out, like compared to if you have to do the other different kind of like algorithms. Then you will have to 
you'll have to do a lot of like intermediate steps. Um, so first of all, you have to like do camera calibration. Um, you will have to like do some post processing to the images, um, aligned images. So if you're like, even though you have like really good, like you have aligned your images or like your cameras are pretty good, you will still go in and try to align them or like rectify them um, afterwards when you're calibrating your cameras and so on. So there's a lot of steps of act like doing depth estimation with computer vision and like stereo cameras compared to just like having deep learning models um, taking care of that. Um, right. Yeah. So it's like, so turn, it's like, it's not really for, like you could do all of that uh, sort of do all the steps of sort of camera calibration with sort of the checkerboard thing. And then you do like the, um, like rectifying the images and like key point, finding the specific key points that you want to measure the distance to, and then do some deterministic algorithm on that mm. uh, and sort of get, and that you, you're like, you're saying that works pretty well, but the step towards deep learning based is that it makes everything, is it like simpler? Like what, what steps are we uh, simplifying or like what makes it easier? Basically, just that we don't have to like do all of these steps here. Um, so again, mm. we'll probably just end up with like a depth map, and then you will need to like calibrate your camera. Um, but the problem with with like deep learning models right now is that the deep learning models they're just doing like relative depth estimation. So if you want to do like absolute depth estimation, you will also like have to train your um, so the models output will actually like need to um, they will need to like um, be dependent on your camera. Uh, so I know that they're actually like they're giving up like what cameras they're using for like okay. creating these uh, benchmarks and and so on. Um, but you will, if you want to get like really good relative depth information, you will need like the camera information um, and the camera parameters as well. Um, so so it might be it might be in the future that we can like some kind of like train a deep learning model. You'll throw in your your camera parameters. Um, it is. One of, one of the bottlenecks with, with it is also like it's hard to generate like a, a data set. So like the ground truth data set for uh, for your, your actual like uh, deep learning models. Um, so I think that will be the hard part. Like the, the, the easy part will basically just as in any other like a deep learning uh, project. The hard part is actually like getting the data set. Um, once you have the data set, it is fairly easy to work with. You just have like a model. You don't have to do like additional um, algorithms, functions on top of it. Um, so I think it's a, it's a trade-off and, and, uh, but I think there will be like a lot of research and, and development going on, um, for, for actually getting good depth estimation with, uh, with deep learning models as well. Yeah. So, so like right now, like I know, uh, what is it called? Midas? Like, is that, that is the algorithm, like one of the popular ones, uh, right? Uh, That's only for monocular, right? Yeah. Okay. Are there, but okay. So are there deep learning for stereo vision, like based on stereo setup? Yeah, for sure. Uh, there is um, so so basically again, it will basically just like estimate the depth in the two images or like more like the disparities. Um, but then once you have the disparities, so you will have a very smooth like disparity map. Um, but then again, you will need the camera information um, okay. to actually like get to the ne next step of getting uh, the depth values. So I'll more say like Midas, uh, Midas, and, and those models. They are more like they're actually like just getting. It is kind of like a depth map, but it's not like absolute depth values. So it's more like a disparity map. Right. So for, for stereo vision based, you would, uh, you would just send it into the model, right? I don't know which type of, what is sort of a popular one for, for that? I'm not, I'm not literally work like uh, too much with the, uh, with stereo models. No. Okay. 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 Cause I, I'm like, okay. So you would actually like, you would just need uh, the camera cal parameters and then you would actually be able to get absolute depth. Um, yeah, f yeah, for sure. But, uh, but, but then you will also have like some some limitations of the actual like model trained. If you have like a different camera, um, mm. then it will act like it will throw out different like depth values based on based on the camera as well that it was uh, that it was trained on, okay. and then the resolution will also um, will also have an effect. Okay, and so I as it you... yeah, sir. Yeah, so so as as it is right now, like if I'm just doing like some, I just want to get like some relative depth values. I will I probably just go like with uh, with depth estimation with a monocular. We can do some like smaller tasks with stereo vision where we like create our own stereo vision, then stereo vision where we just match like uh, the two points in two images. But like if we're creating like some larger project, like uh, where we want to get like high accuracy, um, we have some really good cameras out there and they are relative cheap as well. If you're doing like robotic applications um, and so on. Right. And so then you just directly get the, the power cloud. Yeah. Then you just directly get the point clouds. Um, yeah. Mm, okay. Then you don't and want to like. Then you don't have to do any pro uh, like any processing at all. You just directly get the output, and then you can then you can work with that in your application. Okay. 
Interesting. And uh, so what type of projects have you mostly been uh, working on when it comes to computer vision? Like, are you uh, like, I know you do some freelancing and so on. Like what, what uh, have you been, what are you work, working on like lately or what kind of yeah. project? Yeah, so for sure, like right now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm both working like a full-time position and then I have like some freelance projects um, on the sideline. Um, so I've pretty much like worked with, uh, with a bunch of stuff. Um, so right now I'm both combining like deep learning and, and, and computer vision and just creating different applications. I have uh, done some applications with, for example, like, um, image stitching. So like a real time image stitching, it's actually like a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty complex task to do. So basically doing image stitching on a GPU. So it's just, it's some CUDA programming and, and, and stuff like that. Um, it was actually like a pretty complex task to do, um, and then also just basically camera calibration, a lot of camera calibration, rectification of cameras, um, getting getting depth information with two cameras. Um, so people have been trying to to use like phones to get depth information, like take uh, take photos from from different angles, um, try to reconstruct that. Um, so I have done a bunch of projects with uh, with uh, with stereo vision, just getting like a stereo camera working for. Uh, for companies getting like some dev values that they can integrate into their application and then also just like a bunch of uh, deep learning um, deep learning um, deep learning projects with different optic detectors uh, some segmentation task uh, for like retail retail uh, retail shops um, yeah, basically just like the standard um, standard optic detection where you want to just apply some logic on on top of the outputs from uh, from the model Okay, cool. And so what, um, what would you say is like, for get, uh, like when companies like contact you, what are they looking for? Like for freelancing, how does those type like structures usually look like? Yeah. So, so, so basically like they, they reach out to me if they have a, they have a problem, um, and project that, uh, that is suitable. Like they mostly find me, um, through my YouTube channel. So they already know, like they they probably have some problems. There's they're they're searching for it on YouTube. Um, so, and then again, they just find my videos. I also have some videos with, uh, with the open 3d, um, 3d, uh, framework, which right. is basically just like open CV for, for point clouds. Uh, so it's also like a pretty good, uh, pretty good, uh, framework as well. So it's mainly, mainly like for, for the, for point cloud, uh, projects. But then when they reach out to me, we basically just like talk about the projects, uh, what I can, what I can do and, and all those different things. Um, most of the projects like people reach out to me about is, is more like research projects or like startup project projects where they want to like solve or like they want to solve something that haven't been done before. So I, I'm, I basically just say to them, like, we, we, we need to keep this as an, some kind of like iterative process. Uh, we go in one direction, we see like how that goes, then we can change from that, like change direction, um, and so on, because like people, they also tend to like, uh, can you try to like estimate the number of hours for these specific problems? And it's just like. It is it's really hard to do because it has not been done for before. It's not like um, if people reach out to me and just say like, okay, can you train an update detector? I have the data set. Can you train an update detector for me? Okay, I can, I can like r roughly estimate the hours for that. But like if the projects haven't been done before, like if if it's not like something already out there, basically just like copy paste in um, in the code world. Um, but then we just try to like keep it as an uh, as an iterative process and and then then just go for there. That's a good point because I've I've experienced that as well. That's a super difficult one when you're talking to sort of more business oriented people and they want to know like how long will this take, and like the answer is I don't know. Like it's uh, as you say, like it's an iterative process where you will try something and you will go down a particular direction and then maybe you'll realize you know no we should have done that instead and like even training a model like how long does that take it it really, you know it's kind of uh, different for us right doing. In machine learning where it's not like you can progressively improve the model continuously like it's not it will work it will probably work in the beginning but it's like how well do you want it to work and what how long will it take to get those especially it's if it hasn't been done before then you don't know like you don't no. know um and, and how do you deal with that then like when people come to you and be like uh how long like how, how many hours will this take uh, I basically just tell them like I have to do it uh, in a, in like an iterative uh, in an iterative way. Uh, we have to like keep trying things out. Like again, we start with a pretty good idea. We just like try to like, take a look at it for 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 some hours, like ten twenty hours, something like that. Like let's see what we can do, and then we can go from there. Um, I, I I wouldn't commit to like a project saying like okay, I can do this project in hundred hours because like if it ends up taking like two or three hundred hours, 
um like it will just be like a burden for me and it, it wouldn't be worth it at all um so i don't really i'm not really forced to take any projects like i can i can basically like choose choose whatever i want to and again it is hard to like work with a company that doesn't like follow the same like mindset and 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 the way that we're into like develop this project so like if if they're not on, on if we're not on the same page and we don't want to like keep it as an iterative process and and evaluate over time go in different directions then it wouldn't be a good fit anyway so that's uh, that's kind of like how um, how I'm dealing with it yeah i think that's the only way to deal with it because there's i think like the the conflicting thing is that there are you know there are um perhaps uh other like why they i guess want to make sure like how long does it take is because they might do contracts with people and then like they they're like uh they like maybe they won't produce anything like they maybe uh they'll just sort of waste time pretty much like so maybe that's why they want to perhaps make sure like how long will this take so you can understand the concern but it's also pretty impossible uh and i think that when when it comes in like the um the trust factor that you know you're not someone that you know, you want to do a good job or like you want to um like make sure that the project succeeds that's when it comes down that's what it also comes down to like making videos and all of that stuff is that you build that reputation for you know making quality work yeah for sure and also just like it's not like it's just like several hundred hours we start off with so they don't really lose much so we basically just start out with like some kind of like uh, research phase uh, so let's see what we can do when i have then like put in the work like if, if i'm looking into like a project for like 10 20 hours okay then i have a better understanding of like how long it's actually going to take and i can come up with a better estimate and if we just like end up with like after 10, 20 hours, okay, this is not possible or like it will just take like too long. I can't commit on this. Then it's not like the end of the world that the company has to like pay me like for, for 10 or, or 15 hours. Um, and it's also good to like, I think it's actually good. And, and I don't think like people, they put put in like too much investment into into the research date. Um, so there's actually like a lot of times where People, like companies they don't want to like they, of course they don't want to like uh, waste their money but again they don't want to like put in like okay let's say that i want 20 hours for doing like some research about a project then they will rather like have me do research for like five hours and then work on the actual like, project for 15 hours but but what does that matter if i'm then working like 15 15 hours in the wrong direction uh then it'll just be like a total waste in the end so i think it's better to like in the start like spend more time of, of actually like, figuring out like what are the possibilities um what directions can we go what approaches can we take and then just basically just just like set up some different approaches and then just give it a waiting like what path you actually like take before we actually like taking it. Uh, it 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 is okay to go in the wrong direction we just don't want to go in the wrong direction for uh, for too long um so i don't yeah. think like companies should be too scared of actually like, putting money into like the research states to start with um, and again, we're only talking like a um, few hours, like we're not talking like several hundred hours that will just be waste for them. Um, so not like, it's not too big of a gamble. Yeah, makes total sense. Um, like, um, let's see. So I did have some points of follow up on that. Um, let's see, there's a lot, like I've written down a lot that we can talk about too. Um, let's see. So like um, workflow wise, how do you work? Uh, like how what would you, what would you say is like good workflow for for you? Yeah, so good workflow is uh, for me is basically like I can I can pretty much choose um, at whatever time I'm working. Like sometimes I work in uh, late at night. Like I find myself most productive like um, in the middle of the night, like two a.m. Working like from 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 twelve uh, to to two a.m. or something like that, like three a.m because then the rest of the world is pretty much leaving. Like I don't get notifications. I don't uh, like everyone is basically just asleep. So I find myself most productive um, at that time. Uh, right now I'm working like a, a full-time position. So some of my time is is fixed to like a specific time of the day. It's not like 100% fixed. It's not like a nine to five job, but I can put in like five, four, four hours here, four hours in the evening and, and stuff like that. So I still have a, a bit more flexibility, but I still have to like put in like roughly like eight hours each day um, for that. Um, and then I can do like all the other projects on, um, on the sideline. So I, I just like my workflow, it should be, it should be as free as possible. Um, I want to, I pretty much just want to like do uh, whatever I want. Also like I'm, I'm, I'm working remotely uh, mostly. So sometimes I'm also like uh, traveling and, and, and stuff like that. I want to be free free to do those different things as well. 
but uh, but the most important thing for my workflow is basically just that uh, that I'm free uh, because if I just have to like sit here, okay, I force you to sit here for eight hours. Okay, I sit here, do some work for eight hours, but it's not a, a pr productive. If I was just like, if I if I was basically just like choosing, okay, I'll do this in the evening. I'll spend three hours on it. I will be more productive. The company will get way more out of it compared to if they just forced me to sit like for eight hours and then do this. Yeah, I totally agree. And for me, it's also a, a value thing where like being told like there are companies where you have like a you have like check in, like you have like a tag. You need to be here a particular time and you leave a particular time uh, yeah. like that. I mean, that I mean, it could be that that works well for many people like having that structure. But it's something that where for me, like knowing that you have to do something uh, is just sort of I really enjoy the fact that people put faith on you or like put faith in like you can do the work and like your it's your responsibility to choose when you do it or like how you want to structure it and sort of like what matters in the end is getting getting things done right it doesn't matter sort of exactly that you're like fixed to like a particular time that you have to sit here and like if you're like yeah well today i'm like super tired then there's it makes no sense to like if you're not productive that day no, sure. it's better to just go with the like I don't know. It's kind of, uh, kind of. I don't know how. How has that been for you, though? Like, sort of, when you have, what do you do for sort of balancing? Sort of when you, um, I don't know how your work is. Like for me, I like to go like really deep into work, and that's all I think about. Let's sort of get absorbed in it, and then I get sort of tired of it, and then I do something else for a couple of days, <laughs> and that's sort of my my workflow. Do you have more consistent workflow, or do you like how do you? balance uh working really hard and uh sort of taking time off what do you do yeah so, so I, th I think i have more like uh, i think i have more like uh, my work like for for each day so um it, it really depends like again you can't really be productive like eight hours a day that's that's just uh that's just impossible i just try to like uh, i just try to like work whenever i feel like uh, feel like I'm, I'm productive i can also put in like work when i'm not productive i just try to like I basically just try to 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 figure out like okay what are the most important things to do when i'm actually like in my productive zone or like in, when i have my productive time if i'm editing videos I, I can i can do like i can edit my videos after like i've been working like for 12 hours a day and that's not a problem because it's it's not like really that consuming um so so it's, it's also like when when people reach out to me it, um i also base like um, i also like base the cost on on how much like brain energy does it actually like, take for me uh, because like I can do a job for like eight hours and then I can like then I can go home and do like all my things for like eight hours as well. But like if you're doing like eight hours, like something that basically just like kills your brain um, and then I'm not able to go home, do anything else um, than basically just like going to sleep. Then um, so it it real it real depends. Yeah, it really depends. Yeah. I know that you've also been doing like uh, combining like freelancing and uh, like traveling, right? Uh, yeah, for sure. How, so, that's uh, go ahead. Yeah, how, how's that been? Uh, like, how do you, does the, do you find that balance to work too? Uh, sort of working while traveling, or do you take work and then travel? Sort of, how do you do that? It's ba basically like a, a combination of both. I um, I like to just like uh, do some work and then go out and, and and travel. I don't really like to just like um travel for like a week or like uh, be at the beach for a week. I can't I can't really do that. I, it will just uh, it will just stress me out. Um, so I, I'm actually like. I feel more stressed when I'm not doing uh, like anything and especially like yeah. for uh, for a longer period of time. So I can't just be like at the beach for for a week. Then I would rather like um, work eight hours and then go then go explore different kind of things. Uh, so last week I was just in um, so I, I'm working like full time in Dubai, a remote position right now. But then like last week um, I was down there working for a week and it was actually like a pretty good, uh, pretty good like balance where, OK, I went to the work like eight to eight, eight to eight to eight to four. And then I was basically just out uh, out exploring um, after that, so I found that that was actually like a pretty good uh, pretty good balance. But um, okay, cool. the most yeah. important thing is to me that I balance like work and also just experiences. I can also go out and experience things. Like I can like I can go to whatever. Like I I can do like I can go to like a amusement park or something like that. But then I can still like okay if I get like a call or like I have to answer a mail or. Um, or like a message or something like that. Like I can still, I can still do that. Okay, I'm, I'm out here. I'll still just take up a phone, um, record a video or something like that. So I try to just like balance it, and it seems to work for me. I can't really like, I can't really just like, okay, right now, 
I just shut my phone down. I won't answer anyone. Now I have my weekend. I can't really do that. It will just like it. Um, it it's kind of like when I'm not working, it just makes me more uh, stressful. And and I, and I just think like, okay, I have to be productive. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that I think we share the same thing there because like if I do, if I'm off, like not doing anything for two days, then my brain is going to be like, what are you doing? <laughs> what, uh, sure. what, what, like, what, when are you going to start doing things? And like, what's the next thing? Like, what are you uh, wanting to do? So like for me, that's been a challenge to sort of find uh, a, a good balance where uh, like, particularly when it comes to travel and so on, because I've been thinking like, if I want to start traveling more, but I don't know, you said it worked well sort of for uh, working and then, uh, you know, exploring. That would be sort of the, I think, the ideal. Uh, but for some reason, uh, it might. I feel like it might be difficult to sort of uh, travel, but still work. I don't know if I could be as productive when I'm not home. Like, I, no, I no, enjoy no. having my setup and like everything. Yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't like any anywhere like near uh, as productive as I would have been like um, at my own place. Okay. Um, not anything like near because i was basically like working from my from my from my laptop it's just way harder than when you have like uh like multiple like monitors set up you have your own chair desk you even have like your own keyboard uh, that you're used to so i'm not used to like a laptop keyboard you don't have your mouse and all those different things uh so i was not like anything or any like anywhere near productive as as i would have been um at home but I've, i still think it's, it's it's pretty good to like take a break like once in a while um and then still keep uh like still be productive even though you're you're out uh, traveling and experiencing things what do you do more like do you do you find that like uh the gym uh i know also by the way a question i saw like a short video you made uh, or like a life as a as an engineer uh -huh. or something where yeah, uh maybe. you had you had a dog you st like how does that work do you travel with the dog or no, no i don't i don't know oh okay oh that's uh that's that's too hard yeah yeah okay. i don't really like to do that yeah but yeah i do a lot of uh, i do a lot of different things like i also like to go to the gym i'm doing some doing some sports like going out with friends and, and stuff like that and then it's just like like it, it is enough free time for me to like go to the gym like for two hours a day and then i can work like 12 or 14 hours uh or something like that or like go out with friends in the evening after like working the whole day i, I pretty much i pretty much just feel like that is the perfect day for me um so uh so it's not really like a burden burden for me to do actually like work i really like it it's both my work but also my um it's it's actually like my hobbies um like doing these projects like freelance work creating youtube content and, and all those different things yeah. so it's a pretty good like it's a pretty good balance of of all the things um so that's also really important to to keep in mind and also why i think like most people like people they should they should they should basically do what whatever they want to do like i know a lot of people they go to, to go to their job they, they do their work but they don't really want to do it they, they just do it because they have to um and i just think like the earlier you start to think in 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 like that way of you want to give yourself more freedom um like the faster you will just achieve it and if you don't try to do anything towards that like you will never you know, like you will never achieve it unless you uh unless you win the lottery or something like that um so yeah, i think yeah, that I is agree, a yeah. that is pretty good as well yeah I can totally relate to that. I feel like there are, I mean, like you spend so much time on your work, right? Regardless of what you do. I feel like it, it doesn't make any sense to do something other than what you really love, like what you really like to do. But it is a difficult uh, topic. Like for me, when I was uh, starting to study, I was like, what, what I want to get into. And, you know, it's a confusing phase. Like you don't know there are so many different things uh, that you could go into. Like for me, I was like, do I want to get into this area or this? And, you know, to me, machine learning didn't even exist like in my brain. Like it did, I didn't know about it. Um, uh, let's see. All right. So like for me, that was difficult. Uh, and to me, I don't know. Have you read like Cal Newport bo books on like deep work? And uh, yeah, I've read, I've read those. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, did, I did some reading like uh, in the past. I haven't really done it uh too much lately I, I want to get into that as well but again but uh, i've been a bit busy here uh the last couple of months but I, I definitely want to get into reading again it's also it's also pretty nice and it gives you some some really nice perspective and and also some tips and tricks for for your life and and how to get into this mindset here and actually like, try to to improve your uh, improve your life like 
you have to put in the work like you have to put in the effort to start with like you can't just you can't achieve anything before you have actually put in the work in the start like i created my first like 100 or like 150 videos on youtube uh basically without like earning anything um and again right now it, it's not because like i'm making like a huge amount of, of, of money on the act like uh, ads from google or like from youtube it's more like all the other different kind of like things from the sideline that that it gives you um, i'm also like creating some courses and stuff like that um, I started to create some courses like uh, five, like three, four, or five months ago. They actually like, make me more money now than than my actual like, YouTube channel. So um, okay, it gives you a lot of possibilities that you can that you can branch out to um, and monetize in different ways. So uh, right, yeah, I know you. Yeah, I, I uh, I've actually never uh, done a course. Like all I've done has been on YouTube. What would you say is that has been like? Is that uh, like? Because I guess like you may you can spend more time on it because you know it's gonna give like a return or like how do you how do you find that uh, doing courses? Um, yeah, so so one thing is that I, I know that over time it will make me more money. Again, when you're creating course, you will not get instantly paid for uh, for what you for your project like have. But right now I'm creating I'm I'm creating some courses and they act like they do they do pretty well um, after like even like a couple of months, and it's just like okay. I'm spending the time now. Let's say I'm spending like 50, 100 hours on the course. Then I know that, okay, I want to make the money now. But like over time, maybe like after even like a year or like half a year, um, the time I spend on those courses, they are already, they like, they have already like, uh, they're already doing pretty fine. Um, and then once I have created a course, like, to, so one of the mo one of the most important things to think about as well is that you just have to create it once. Like you just have to create the videos once, the courses once, pretty much just like all of the content. And then you can just like sell it. It will be there for like, for the whole lifetime, as long as YouTube is there, for, um, of course, and the internet. Um, but I can't like imagine like a feature if you're just looking yeah. like t 10, 20 years out there and YouTube and, and Google and all those different kind of things um, not being here. Uh, so it will be out there for a, a very long time and only had to like put in the effort once compared to like doing some other jobs where you ba you basically get paid for uh, the time you're spending on it. But here I'm more like, I'm not really getting paid for my time. I'm, I'm getting paid for uh for my knowledge and um and the content that i'm putting out there and what platforms do you have your own platform like your own website or do you you them or like what or like how i don't know how this works like i, I know you have coursera that's your, usually like and then udemy and uh, there's um, something called uh, teachable um i was i basically just went to google and found the found like the easiest way it's they have some pretty good structures for setting up courses um like pretty good customizations as well like they take care of, care of everything i basically just have to like upload the videos um and do some customizations to the sale page and and uh yeah and and, and set up like the front page and, and and stuff like that so i basically just used like what was on the on the top of google i just uh i just wanted to get started and uh, and try it out yeah because it i mean it makes sense like like the amount of time i've spent making videos and the return i've made on monetization it's like that is not worth it you know oh no for sure for sure no. <laughs> like monetization is like the uh yeah it doesn't make any sense like so for people like thinking that it's for like some people are like you put ads and like you make money on like i make no money on these like i uh. could i mean it's like so little i could almost like dis disable it but it's like just barely worth it to keep it nah, so. sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh all right so let's see uh what are you yeah so i'm curious like what are your goals for the future like we talked about sort of freelancing uh would you like to work at a big company or like a startup would you create your own startup or do you find freelancing to be a, a good fit uh it basically like depends again uh right now i'm working like full-time i have a full-time position and then i have like freelance work besides that right, um, right. i don't think i want to like uh, work for like uh, for like a large organization it, it it really depends like a large, large like uh, cooperation or something like that uh, because then you're really like limited you will basically like only work on a sp specific things where like in startups or like in smaller companies uh, you have like way more areas that you uh, that you can do stuff in um, so I'm more like that kind of a person I, I, I do more like like getting in new projects like I can't imagine myself just working on the same thing for like the next two or three years unless it is something like that I'm a part of or like it is a part of something bigger so like I could imagine myself like for example like working for for like Tesla Neuralink or or something like that like if I'm just like throwing it out there, uh, but those are also like 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 some of the few ones that I would actually like, consider, um, even though it it probably won't be like a 
like a possibility anyway. Um, but then I'd rather just have like some star. I'm also like part of some star hosts right now. Uh, we're doing some some pretty cool things. Um, so I, I have a lot of things going on. I really like it. Uh, I like to 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 do a lot of different things. Um, get a new project once in a while um, instead of just working on the same thing. What do you think of a PhD? Is that something that would be interesting? Oh, never. <laughs> so I I don't really like here are my masters. I haven't really like uh, so on the masters. Uh, I didn't really go to like university classes. So I was taking a robotics degree. Um, I'm a robotics engineer. Um, I took my bachelor after my bachelor started my YouTube channel and then I um, I didn't really go to like so I got interested after like I'm not really into robotics that much anymore more like I am but like more with like uh, cameras and, and stuff like that um, and production uh, settings um, but then we got into like computer vision like uh, computer vision AI and all those other kind of things and then I I basically just branched into that instead of uh, instead of robotics uh, we had a lot of like introduction to AI and computer vision on uh, on the masters. Uh, but then from the YouTube, I was actually like just already doing like research. I was also also like I was creating projects. I was also like I was already like doing the research, uh, reading papers, like looking up like machine learning models, architectures, how can train models, and all those other things. So the things that I was I was I was already working on, we just like started with that in the courses. Uh, so I don't really, I didn't really have to like attend the court uh, like the courses or like the classes um, on my masters. Um, so. And and right now, like I I, I won't really like do like a PhD because one thing one thing is the money, uh, another thing is like the freedom, and also um, you'll be like I've never I, I've never like I've never even like thought about it. Um, it's just like a no go for me. I don't really I don't really I'm not really into like the academics uh, setting. I'm I'm more like uh, I want to get something out in the in the real world and interesting. And yeah, works, I, so. I can relate to that. Like I'm I. Uh think i feel the same way like i was reflecting on like doing a, a phd potentially but you know there are um like like okay so like for me like i did my bachelor's and that's actually when i started making videos like after my bachelor's mm. and you know i'm uh i didn't really feel qualified to make videos but like apparently i was right i was people watch them and find them useful uh but then sort of I, I thought, you know, uh, really, I, uh, I should do I should take a master's because that's, you know, that will I will learn so much from a master's. Like there's there's so much knowledge that I don't know. Like I should I should do that. And, uh, you know, honestly, like now I am almost like this, like in just a couple of months, like I'm, I've completed my master's. And honestly, I kind of regret taking like I honestly feel like I've learned more doing personal projects and like on my own than 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 sort of the degree itself. But on the other hand, like society tells you, like you need to have a, like you should have a degree, or like otherwise, like you're doing some some nonsense. And I guess I listened to that because that's why sort of why I decided to take a master's. But looking back now, it's kind of been I learned more from on my own than I would have on my master. And sort of looking at the amount of videos I've created lately, I mean, it's a lot fewer because I've been busy, you know, studying. Uh, and so, like looking back, I don't know. Like, don't, if people watch, listening to this, like, don't take this as as advice. Like, degree is bad. Like, degree is good. Like, obviously, it's not a waste of time. But like personally, for me, I, I, uh, it's 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 a it's a feeling that you should have have that people put pressure on like having a degree. But I don't know. Like, how has your experience been like? Is that uh, do you have you found that like having a degree is really uh key or like h how do you think uh think about it actually actually i think uh i think having a degree is is very beneficial in like the current world like i think there's a lot of companies uh being very conservative um regarding that so i think it's very beneficial to have a degree and i don't really like even though i'm probably not like i'm probably never going to like use my degree even though if i'm just like applying for some positions like they have some requirements that you actually like, need to have a degree or like similar experience of course um, but even though I'm probably never going to use my degree or like my specific degree, uh, then I still don't regret doing it because when you're doing your degree, you will still have a lot of time on the sideline where you can do like whatever you want to do. Um, especially if you're taking a degree, um, that you're studying yourself on the sideline, you don't really have to spend that much time. Um, it also depends on your country. So like, I have to say that in Denmark, you get, you get like your, your degrees for, for free. Like we pay a lot of taxes, uh, but you actually get your degree for free. So for, for me, uh, I don't really regret it. 
um, it was it, it is actually like a no brainer. So I should just take it and I should just like spend my time uh, doing my stuff. I can still follow along because the things that I'm doing is, is still the exact same thing that is in like the courses and on that degree. Um, but I don't have to spend the time on it. I can basically just do whatever I want to do. Um, so I can work on my own and I can then still just, I can just still just like attend the exams. I'll still, of course, I'll have to like put in some effort, like during the exam period and stuff like that. Um, but again, I sh I can just like take the degree while doing all the other things here on the sideline. It might be, um, it might be like way different to, to other people where you actually like have to pay for your own degree. Um, then I don't think it will be like too necessary because like you can get off with like a, a very like large student loan. You can end up with a student loan you have to pay off like for like so many years after after you completed it. And I don't think it's necessary to have any more. There's also like a lot of uh, companies coming up right now that don't require like your degree, especially not if you have a personal brand or like building your own portfolio. Um, and stuff like that but again if you don't if you don't have a degree or you don't have any like personal brand you don't have a portfolio you have nothing on github then a degree is pretty good to have uh, because like if you're not known there like how how should people know like what you're capable of um if they basically just have like a blank page yeah i i i think you're right like i you, like it it is really beneficial to have and it, it says for me too i'm from sweden so like in sweden there are uh it's, university is free so it makes sense to like to like oh. do it uh but learning wise sort of time well in well spent uh yeah uh but i agree like if you apply you're gonna have to showcase either you're gonna have to have a really strong personal brand or you're gonna have like the degree to back you up um all right so cool to get your thoughts on that um yeah i think we're sort of uh wrapping up a little bit uh yeah, sure. we've been we've been talking for over an hour now uh yeah, i was uh i curious of to maybe for people uh you know uh listening that are you know beginners uh and sort of want to learn uh, about sort of specifically maybe about computer vision um let's say you know we take you and we uh, reset your knowledge how would you uh how would uh, you make nikolai like learn most optimally yeah, so basically i, I would just uh, i would I'll, i would just try to like improve like all the time i, I was like look at your track record like again when you put things out there you'll basically get like a track record just try to improve like um for like every video if you're creating videos in in, in that instance um if i just like lost everything today i will definitely do it over so uh, i'll definitely recommend people just like act just like the most important thing is to actually like just act uh do something do something that you that you like um and then things will just come over time again there will also be some some very bit bad like periods. Um, I had some periods where like for like six months to a year or something like that, where I didn't want to like create any any content at all. Um, I didn't really feel like creating videos. I was getting like I was getting like some hate. I didn't really get like a lot of views. I wasn't I wasn't really like I was putting in a lot of hours into it. I wasn't really like making anything. Um, but again, you just have to like stay dedicated. You have to just act. You just have to keep like on track because in the end it will pay off for sure. Like. I can't I can't really think of like any examples where like if you just put in the effort and you put in the time, stay dedicated, like it will for sure pay pay off in the end. Um in some way, like both experiment wise and also experience wise, but also um money wise if we're if we're talking in that uh, in that direction as well. So just try to improve for sure. And, and and let's say that sort of specifically for you know machine learning, somebody wants to get into sort of as your like what you're really skilled at sort of computer vision maybe uh you know how does one go from maybe imagine like they have like they all they're basically like they're they're just interested in machine learning how would they go about or what do you think is important to build skill to maybe the goal is to you know uh be able to get like freelancing work uh, and be able to do uh, projects on that uh, what do you think is sort of the 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 key things that you have to learn about and how would you go about learning them yeah so basically like uh if you want to get like freelance work you will definitely of course like need some kind of like portfolio if you're just getting started out with uh, let's say machine learning like learn the basic concepts you don't need to like know like everything like going on under the hood you just need to like know um like the overall stuff um, about it like get to know like how you can train models even like how you can deploy models um 
you don't really like need to know like all the math behind it. Of course, you will need some basic understanding, but you don't really need to like take math courses to actually like be able to create machine learning models. And when you're doing freelance work, you're mainly like creating projects. And when you're creating like projects for for clients, for example, you don't really like you don't need to know like how a neural network acts like works under the hood. You basically just need to like know okay, I have a data set. Okay, how does how does that our data set um, affect the model? What was the hyperparameters do? Um, how can I like deploy the model? So basically, just creating applications around it, um, and then build your own portfolio, create some projects so you can show that off when you're actually like, doing freelance work. Because like most freelance work is actually like creating applications around it. You won't get any like freelance work. Like you want, there won't be like a company reaching out to you to to like come up with a new optimizer for uh, for deep learning models. Like Academia will take care of that for you. Uh, we just want to like use what they what they do in academia and then basically just like create applications um, and projects around it. So go to YouTube, uh, get some get some basic understanding of the different like concepts uh, with machine learning. Also math, like it is also good to have some basic understanding of that. Um, get some basic understanding and then basically just like do something like create projects. You will learn a lot from from actually like, creating projects. Um, and if you're into like a specific area, like if you're into like farming, sports, or like whatever. Like you can you can find like whatever project in that area and just try to create projects around that. Like I can't really like imagine a field where you can apply like AI and, and deep learning computer vision too. Um, so you should be able to come up with some cool projects that uh, that can st like um, make you stay engaged to act like create your portfolio um, and get into it. Yeah. Let's see. So, what what math do you think is is necessary? Like, what what type of math? And then, uh, when it comes to let's say courses, like, have you done any courses that you've been like, this course really helped me, or any books, or uh, like blogs, or like uh, how? What do you think has been most beneficial for you? Um, I'm mainly I'm mainly been using like YouTube for like for getting knowledge, and then it's more like. Okay, if I'm if I'm searching for a specific term, okay, sometimes there comes up uh, like there will there will be some pretty good like medium articles uh, articles as as well, so I will go through those. They are a bit more like technical in in, in those. I think like uh, the media posts are a bit more technical, where like the YouTube videos are is a more mid bit more like um, project oriented. Um, but I got most of my knowledge from uh, from those two platforms, um, and especially uh, YouTube. And then what was the other question? Um like what uh type of math do you say oh yeah you say? yeah that's basically just some like basic linear algebra like how does uh how does vectors matrices and and all those different things uh, work um it is basically like the groundwork between uh, between like neural networks also like how neural networks is trained like back propagation some basic understanding of like derivatives um if you're doing some other projects like maybe like numerical methods um that will help uh, a lot as well so it's not like it's not really like complex math it's it's more like basic like college uh, high school math um that you need to know of um, but um, for sure linear algebra yeah that's really interesting because like what you're saying is uh like more i would say that you're arguing more for like a top-down approach right you're more like what is actually necessary to get to build things right and then yeah. you're like looking at the essentials and that way i think you're absolutely right that you can build become more pr like productive really quickly i sort of went the other way where uh like i have a math bachelor where you know like when i first started doing neural networks i was like let's build one from scratch that was like my first project like building a neural network from scratch like in numpy and like learning about back propagation like doing the math for for matrix mul uh, multiplication, like the derivatives of that and like doing all the details behind that. But if you really boil it down, like that's not necessary at all to get started. And like, I remember I did all the optimizer from scratch, like RMS prop, add a grad, like Adam, like understanding like in detail how they work, but like, it's nice, but like, like you don't need that at all. Like to, to be able to get stuff done and, no, yeah. for sure. Like, don't don't tell me wrong. Like, they are they are really good. Like, things like they are very good to know. Like, all those different things and all the details behind it. It will give you a better understanding. But again, I think if you're just getting started out, you go want to get some freelance work. Like, I think your time and effort um, is spent better on actually like going from from top to down. Where because when you're doing freelance work, you want to get like a bunch of different projects. You don't want to like work on a specific project and then like do something that hasn't done before. 
So like if you're, for example, like working at Tesla, you will probably just do like a specific thing. You want to like do things from from actually like from scratch. You want to do it from like a bottom up approach where if you're doing like freelance work, it will more be like from top to down, especially when you're getting started. Uh, so it really depends on uh, on your situation and like how how hardcore you want to be. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting to get your thoughts on that. Um, anything else on like tips for beginners who are just like starting out? Do you think now is a good time to get into machine learning or do you think it's like too hype now? People should do something else or like, what do you think? I don't think like people should do something else. It is, uh, it is very hype right now. Um, it, it is probably like comparable to, uh, to crypto NFTs and, and all those different things. Um, but I think there's a, a way more like backing AI compared to like NFTs, crypto and, and all those different things. Um, because AI is actually like doing something uh, right now. We have all the development with the GPT models, uh, large language models in uh, in general. And those are like pretty good and they will have a, a, a very big impact on, on the world and especially like in, in the future. And, and also before we think uh, so, AI will actually like have a, have a, like a huge impact on the world. Um, and I can't even imagine like the, um, I can't even imagine it in, 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 in 10 years time. Um, it, it is just crazy when we're going to have like self-driving cars, like robots, uh, walking around, we have like hard, la la large language models, like more, more intelligent than any like human on, on earth and, and all those around things. But I don't think it's too late to get into it. Like we will still like need a lot of like AI engineers act like developing applications around it, like connecting all the strings together. Um, I know we can have like the large language models act like generating the code, but as it is right now, we still need to like connect all the nodes in the future. The AIs will, will definitely like be able to do that. Um, but again, um, before we're going to get into that stage, I, I think that like other like jobs or like other areas are automated before uh, AI engineers and machine learning engineers are are uh, not necessary anymore. Are you like afraid or excited? Uh, it's kind of like uh, it's it's kind of like in 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 between. Like I'm more excited than I'm than I'm afraid. Uh, afraid. Um, I think it's a pretty exciting future, and and it's also like why I like machine learning and and deep learning AI uh, so much. It is that it is that uh, it is changing so fast. Like for like six months ago, we didn't really have like all these GPT models. We didn't really like have all these like crazy AI things. Um, so it's just going it's just going so fast, and all the models like they keep developing. Uh, they're creating some real, really nice applications. It's changing so fast. Like, um, it is not boring to be within like AI and and, and deep learning. Uh, there's coming out so many different like research papers every day. Like, it's so many interesting things. Um, so, if you're like AI engineer, or, like machine learning engineer, it will never, it will never be boring for sure. Um, yeah, then I, it's your I own fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's gonna be a fun ride, man. It's but it's also like tip. it's it's also like pretty hard because it is just impossible to stay up to date. Um, even though you're like spending like hundred hours a week, you wouldn't be able to uh, to stay up to date and, and catch up on any everything. Yeah, you have to definitely give up the idea of going bottom up, like to understand something completely, and just be like getting an overview of some things is fine, and then going deeper on specifics to what you're doing, like projects you're doing, and so on. For sure. uh, that's the only way I can see like it may be maintainable uh, because like it's it's a, it's expanding pretty fast and like even in a specific area there's it's pretty hard to keep up. Uh, I mean I don't I don't do like I don't keep up but I like look at overview and like read uh, the overviews of paper and then I choose like specific papers and then like try to really understand that those uh, but and those are mostly related to like projects I'm doing for work or stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, it's going to be fun, man. It's going to be a fun uh, next 10, 20 years, whatever. <laughs> yeah, for sure. If we're there, if we're in 20 years. Yeah. Uh, oh, are you uh, skeptical? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty optimistic, yeah. I mean, like, a lot of people are really afraid. I mean, like, there are... Have you listened to sort of Max Tegmark or, like, Elon Musk, sort of the stopping of AI prog progression? Yeah, I'm, uh, uh, I've, I've seen with, uh, with Elon Musk, yeah. Yeah. What, what would you say is, like... Do you think it's valid or do you think it's like, uh, sh should we start thinking of like how we could, I don't know, like, uh, make it safer or like, um, yeah, for sure. I, I think it's, uh, I think it's pretty good. Like with the new, uh, company, like rumors about like company, uh, Elon is going to, going to start. Um, I'm really fascinated about like what he, what he's doing. Like he's doing a lot of good things for, uh, for the world and, uh, 
he's definitely like a, a man of the world for um I'm excited to see what he's going to do because I think like some of the corporations like they they basically just want to like they're just thinking about money they just want to be like uh, the best out there um but they don't really like think about like the implications and act like um the future of where it can go they they probably are but but they also they also like um they also like money um, I know that OpenAI is going to release something about the future um as well later this year I think um so it's not like they just want to like uh to let it go out of uh, go out of hand so uh, yeah definitely exciting future but i think uh, i think we need I, I think we should need like some kind of like restriction or like what what elon is going to create like i think he's calling like truth gpt or what what the rumors are um yeah yeah he's he, he, i've listened that he uh he proposes you know also for ai regulation right so that you have to go through some regulatory uh aspect of sort of before you deploy things because now sort of i mean like they're releasing GPT four, and you're like, let's see what happens. Like here, you, here's your here's your API, <laughs> uh, and uh, like making sure that, uh, like I guess his argument is that you know for like building uh, rockets and so on, like it has to go through uh, regulation regulation to make sure that it's safe and like you can actually build it, and you know, uh, and, and it's like a similar thing for AI that before we sort of release chat GPT or GPT-4 or whatever, like future iterations uh, that somebody has taken a look and like, you know, this is that we can, you know, this is not going to be harmful <laughs> to humanity. Yeah, but the main problem is probably like finding like good enough regulators for uh, for that. So it is actually like a pretty hard task and uh, we can't just have like, uh, like the, like the, the conservative uh, regulators or like, just like the, the regulators there are for like all the other different kind of like areas right now, uh, you will actually like need something is like someone with the knowledge about like AI and uh, and its implications. And I think like those people with, with that knowledge right now is, is basically like the CEO and, and the, like the directors and managers of, uh, of those larger corporations as like OpenAI, uh, Tesla, Neuralink and all those different things. So. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think the I think the best regulators of, uh, of AI would actually like be the guys creating the AI, so it's it's kind of like problem problematic because again, you can't really have like AI regulators that doesn't really know like how it works or in what direction it's going because again, it's it's kind of like a black box. Um, they are very like it is not open. It's not really like open AI. They don't really like release uh, release stuff. Um, so I th I think it, it will be pretty hard to like. I think it will be pretty hard to regulate it because like again, like who's going to regulate it? Yeah. For sure, I, I I think you're right. It'll be interesting yeah. to see what happens with that. Um, man, I really uh, enjoyed talking to you. It was yeah, uh, you really uh, cool to get your thoughts on on different things and to get to know you better as well. And uh, yeah, thanks for I uh, really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a great talk.